every day of my life, I ask the same question. Oh Lord, why'd you let me see heaven and take it away? Through his plan, I discovered my purpose is to tell you. God still answers prayers. God still performs miracles. Heaven is real. Well, I told the earlier group that um, I really have never gotten used to the fact that my life is for sale at Walmart. And uh, then they made a movie about it, which is really surreal to have a movie made about your life, frankly, to have people act you, say your words, reenact situations that uh, occurred. So it's very humbling, uh, but it's kind of overwhelming. And um, I never really thought that I would be talking about this. I, I wrote a book so I wouldn't have to talk about it, and that didn't go well at all. This, this book has now sold 8 million copies in 46 languages, so here's the deal. Well, it's a God thing. Here's the deal. I, sometimes you try to put something behind you, and God puts it in front of you. And that may be where you are right now. It may, it may be something you're trying to get over, and actually that is the thing that God will bless others with. So I want to encourage you in that regard. I'm going to share a testimony today, and uh, we all have one. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have a testimony. And hopefully you didn't get run over by a truck uh, on the way to church like me. But your testimony is one that only other people can hear because you're there and it's yours. So I, with, in sharing mine, I'm hoping I'm encouraging to share yours. And you'll find out a little bit more as it develops uh, why that's important. Well, I'm honored to be here at Church on the Rise. Thank you for letting me come. It's a, it's a great privilege and an honor to be here. And um, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Hey, if you're a guest, I want to echo the welcome you've already received. If you're a guest, uh, come back when I'm not here. Uh, in fact, come back next week, uh, for a matter of fact. Um, Bill Weiss will be here and his wife, Annette. Bill um, has an incredible experience, and it's a very, very powerful presentation on um, hell. As, as, as Dr. Paul said, we, we've, done, we've spoken together on the stage on many occasions, but also one after the other. I get the best part as I talk about heaven. He talks about hell. But you know, hell is just as real as heaven. And you don't want to go there. And the good news is you don't have to go there. There's a way. Jesus has provided us a way that so we don't have to go. So come and hear that and bring somebody with you that you care about, that, that you're not sure about their eternal destination. So um, come back next week. But come back again uh, to the church. I mean, everybody needs a church home. I don't know how anybody functions without one, really. We couldn't have made it through the things we went through without a church home. So thank God for this one. And, uh, and come back and consider being a part of it. We're delighted that you're here today, if you're a guest. Thank you. I'm going to sign books uh, after this is finished. And I find myself at a lot of book signing tables over the years. And um, a lady walked up with a copy of this book. And uh, she thrust it in my face. And the book was in bad shape. I mean, it had a lot of miles on it. It looked like it, it was torn up and dirty. And so I proceeded to sign it for her, because that's what she wanted me to do. And then she said, uh, this book is not mine. I said, oh, OK. It's someone else's book. She said, yes, it belonged to my daughter. I said, your daughter's book. She said, I did not know she owned it. Uh, it was in her backpack when she got off the school bus and was run over and killed. I said, this is your daughter's book? Yes. I said, was your daughter a follower of Jesus? Yes, she was. She was very devoted to the Lord. She was a great source of inspiration to me. And I said, well, ma'am, I'm sorry for your temporary separation from your little girl. It's real, but it won't last. She said, it took me a long time to even pick up your book and start reading it. And when I did, I realized my daughter had written a lot of things in your book. She wrote in the margins. She underlined scriptures that are in here. She drew arrows to things that she obviously thought was important. So when I got through reading your book, Mr. Piper, I realized I was not ready to go to heaven. So I gave my heart to Jesus. I know where I'm going now. Do you? Are you sure? We're taking reservations this morning. 
Yeah. We love you here, and we want to love you there. So before you walk out one of these doors, it is our prayer, as it was in the first service when we saw people come to Jesus, that you will too. I got run over on the way to church. I was a pastor, been a pastor for many years. I was in the radio and television business for years before that. But God called me into full-time ministry in 1985. 1989, I was attending a pastor's conference in East Texas at a conference center. I've written some books about it, and these are those books. I have some of the books with me today. 90 Minutes in Heaven is the one that obviously we've talked about. Daily Devotions is a book I brought with me. It's, it's 90 stories for hope and healing, one a day for 90 days. Got some great stories in it. The other books that I do not have with me uh, that I wrote are Heaven is Real, Lessons on Earthly Joy, for people who are trying to get through tragedy and pain and suffering and, and, and trying to make sense of it, get to the other side of it. I got killed on a bridge. It's about crossing bridges. Getting to Heaven is a book I wrote about the words of Jesus from John 13 through 17. How do we live on the way to Heaven? You know, if, we, if we've made a reservation already, how should we be living now? That's what that book is about. And the other book is my wife's book, Eva, uh, A Walk to the Dark. Uh, the movie is based as much on her book as it is in mine. She is the hero of the story. I'm a survivor. She is an overcomer. She's the caregiver who took care of me and our family and got us through this long, dark night. She's the hero. I was at a conference center in East Texas. Well, they made a movie about it, too. I guess the next slide is that movie, uh, or it should be. And um, it is. We have a few of those movies uh, out there on DVD. Like I said, it's just bizarre to have a movie made about your life. So Hayden, Hayden Christensen, the young actor who played um, Anakin Skywalker in all the Star Wars movies, plays me. I told the first group that uh, my kids have started calling me Darth Preacher. I don't know why, but kind of where I am now. Kate Bosworth plays my wife, beautiful actress, very fine actress from Superman Returns and Remember the Titans. This is Fred Thompson's last movie, a great fine actor, but also a senator from Tennessee. Big, booming Fred Thompson uh, plays a very cru cru crucial part in this movie. Michael W. Smith uh, not only wrote the music for the movie, but he is in the movie. He stars in the movie. A uh, great songwriter, Christian performer of many years. So it's, uh, it's a power-packed movie. Uh, we don't watch it. It's just too hard for us to see again. And uh, the next picture probably is my new book, is it? Let's see. Yeah, it is. Hey, I tried desperately to get this book here today uh, because it's released on Tuesday. Yeah, it's a brand new book called People I Met at the Gates of Heaven. Who's going to be there because of you? you only, if you haven't heard the story, you'll know before I finish why this is important. Who's going to be there because of you? And it is about the people I met at the gates of heaven talk about them in a little while. So this book is released on Tuesday. You can order it on any of the major platforms, and it should be in bookstores everywhere on Tuesday. I was at this conference center called Trinity Pines, and I had been there for three days. It, it started on a Monday, finished on a Wednesday, and so I was on my way home from the conference on Wednesday, January 18, 1989, coming up on 30 years ago. Seems like yesterday. It wasn't a sunshiny day like that. It was actually cold and rainy. <laughs> it was 35 in East Texas, which is probably, you know, like sit on your lawn and have tea weather here. But that's really cold there. And so we were on our way home. Lots of pastors we dismissed were headed out in different directions. I was headed to my church, which was south of Houston, about 120 miles away. Well, I drove out. If you drove drive to the right, which is a decision I made to go home. I always had gone home to the left. But I drove to the right that day. If you do that, you have to cross a big lake. There is a bridge at the end of crossing that lake, and this is that bridge. Um, it's called the Trinity River Bridge. And uh, there used to be a river that ran under it, but they dammed up the river downstream and made a big lake, and this bridge is still there. It's still there this day, actually, but it's not in use anymore because it has been... Um, well, it's a memorial bridge, so they couldn't tear it down. It's built to honor veterans of World War I. So I'm crossing the bridge. It's more narrow than it looks like it is. And I'm almost off of it. I'm on my way to church. I got a stack of sermons on the seat beside me. I have my Bible study for that night. It's a Wednesday night. I'm going to do Bible study in the church. So that, that 
is right beside me. I've got sermons. I'm ready to go. I'm on my way to church, and I am had a good conference, but I can't wait to get home. Before I exited the opposite end of that bridge, coming down a steep embankment from the opposite direction, is a Texas Department of Corrections prison truck driven by an inmate. He's hauling food. He's diving at a high rate of speed. He's not the regular driver. The regular driver was sick that day, so they gave the keys to this guy. He's driving about 60, 65 in a 40 mile an hour zone. I'm driving about 40, and I'm thinking about church. He came down that embankment. He said a car pulled out at the last minute. He swerved to miss that car, and he hit me head on. The nine wheels on the driver's side of the truck just ran over my car, crushed it, shoved it up against the railing of the bridge. He went off the other end, went back in the lane he should have been in, and hit two more cars before he finally brought the rig to a halt. Massive four-vehicle pileup on the Trinity River Bridge, very isolated area. It took a long time for police and ambulances to arrive. They did. They started working the accident. They sent four paramedics because there were four cars. And miraculously, the other two drivers of the other two cars and the truck driver were not harmed. They were shaken up, of course. Their vehicles were totaled. So all four paramedics ended up working on me at the same time. Well, that's quite amazing. And they were doing everything they could to try to revive me because I was killed instantly in the car, which I think brings up an interesting question. If I was killed instantly in the car wreck, what am I doing in Westlake? Let me ask you the same question. What are you doing here? What are you doing in Ohio? What do you have to show for your life up to this point? Put a bookmark in it. We'll come back to it. Well, they did everything they could. They were unsuccessful. I was pronounced dead on the scene. They're waiting for a medical examiner to come to the scene to release the body, do the paperwork. They have to have an investigation. It's a fatality before they could take me away. So everything's at a standstill. It's a, it's a crime scene for all practical purposes. This next picture is from the newspaper in that area the next day, a Huntsville newspaper. It's kind of grainy, but it's an old picture. And uh, there's the picture of a car up on the railing of the bridge. Uh, you can see a tarp inside the car. All the windows obviously have been knocked out. So I am under that tarp, dead. Traffic now is backing up in both directions because it's the only bridge across that lake. Behind me are lots of pastors who have been to the same pastor's conference I've been to. And they're uh, headed home or they're headed to their churches to do Wednesday night Bible studies like me. They're not going anywhere now because the bridge is blocked. One of them, at least, walked up on the bridge, he and his wife, Dick and Anita on a record. He pastored a church north of Houston, mine was south of Houston. We're on the highway on our way to do the same thing, do a Wednesday night Bible study. He sees all this wreckage and he says to the policeman in charge, state trooper, officer, I am a uh, pastor in Houston and I see there's been a terrible wreck here. I'd like to pray for the victims. And the policeman said, well, that's very kind, but there's no one to pray for. Everyone else is okay, but the man in the red car, he's dead. He's a fatality. He didn't make it. When the policeman said that, God spoke to the preacher, which we've decided is a good idea. Don't you want a preacher God speaks to? Yeah, so do I. But let me say this to you. I think God's doing a lot more speaking than we are listening. Yeah. He was listening that day because God said to him, pray for the man in the red car. Well, that didn't make any sense to him. I was dead. Four paramedics worked on me. They couldn't possibly revive me. I had been pronounced dead. I had blood coming out of my ears and eyes and nose, but it was all dried because my heart stopped beating immediately. So I didn't have a near-death experience. <laughs> when you're dead an hour and a half, you're not nearly dead. So he got in the car and prayed for me. Well, he, they didn't want him to get in the car. They told him that he'd have to pray out here if he wanted to. No, he wanted to put his hand on me and pray for me. So he had to crawl in from the back. This next picture is the actual car, like that one is, at the wrecking yard. And you could see the car and the top photo, the trajectory of the truck that ran over me, and it crushed my head against the side of the car, so I had massive brain damage. I was impaled on the steering wheel. You can see how he crawled in from the hatchback from the back of the car because it's the only way he could get in the car. The next picture actually shows a side view so that the steering wheel went horizontal and into my chest, so I had internal injuries. 
and uh, certainly the brain damage, and my, my legs were broken by the collapsing dashboard when the weight of the truck ran over. My right leg was broken at the knee, it no longer went this direction, it went the opposite direction, and it hit my left leg, I must have slid in the seat a little bit, right above the knee, and it severed my left leg just above the knee. It was such a massive injury that four and a half inches of femur, the largest bone in the human body, was ejected from the car and never found. I put my arm up when the truck was coming for me, and that's the moment the truck ran over me, and it took my arm into the back seat of the car, and from here forward was lying on the back seat of the car. I had been dismembered. Well, Dick Onorecker saw that under the tarp, and so he put his hand on my right shoulder, the only thing I did not break, and he's praying for me under the tarp in the dark. Amazing turn of events. Well, they did find my ID. You know, they searched me to try to find who I was. When they found my ID, they called my home in Friendswood, south of Houston. Nobody was at home. My wife was teaching school. She was supposed to go with me on this conference, but she had eight new students at the beginning of the January semester, and she did not want to leave her eight new students with a substitute teacher, or she would have been in the seat beside me in the car. Well, she was at school. They didn't know that. So they did find my business card in my wallet, South Park Church, Don Piper, pastor. So they called my church and told them I'd been in a terrible accident, but not that I was dead because they haven't notified next of kin yet. So all the church knows is I've been in an accident, and they started praying. I was on my way to lead a prayer meeting, and suddenly I became a prayer meeting, and they started calling everybody in the Houston phone book. That's a lot of churches in the Houston phone book, six million people in that area. And it started spreading across the state. It started spreading across all the states. It started spreading around the world. And many thousands of people were praying for the man in the wreck on his way to church. Most of them did not know me, although 30 years later, I'm still meeting people for the first time who prayed for me that day. Met one in Modesto, California, just not very long ago. The man was crying. He extended his hands, and he was crying, like, loudly. And he said, finally, when he got a hold of himself he said I prayed for you that day and I said well it worked I'm here and he said no you don't understand I prayed for you in Taipei Taiwan it was the middle of the night when I got the phone call so I'm still meeting people who pray for me God is not only speaking more often than we're listening he's listening to everything and he was listening to the prayers of these thousands of people who were praying for what what the, what they didn't know was a dead man in a wrecked car on a bridge in East Texas. One man knew that I was dead. He's praying over my dead body in the car, Dick on a record. I think this next slide is a, a screen grab from the movie. This is the man, Michael, who played Dick on a record in the movie. He's crying and singing a song. Well, he was crying before we even filmed the scene. I was supposed to have lunch with him, and the whole lunch he just cried, and he wasn't acting. I mean, that's the kind of impact that it had on him to make this movie. You can see him walking towards the policeman. The policeman is looking down on the bridge at a piece of paper. That's the front page of my next Sunday sermon called, I Believe in a Great God. That policeman picked up the pages of that sermon and presented it to my family. I have it at home in my office. It's covered in my dried blood. So Dick Onorecker's playing, praying. People are praying all over the world. This goes on for an hour and a half. How do we know this? Accident happened at 11.45 on the bridge. It's 1.15 in the afternoon. Dick Connerrecker still in the car, holding onto my right shoulder, praying, and he's beginning to sing prayers like we did this morning. He's singing a very old prayer called, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. It's a great, great old hymn. He's singing it, holding onto my right shoulder under the tarp in the dark, and suddenly, without any warning, under the tarp, I start singing it with him. And he got out of the car really fast. Well, you would, too. And he ran over to the policeman and said this preposterous statement. Officer, the dead man is singing. And nobody believed him. But I do remember singing with him, even if I didn't know who he was. He had to really plead with them to check on me one more time, which is just a completely different story. So. He finally prevailed, they checked on me, and they found out I was alive. Not very alive, but alive. So then they had to get me out of the wreckage of that car, and that took a lot. They had to actually order equipment that was not on the scene to be brought out there from 30 miles away. 
They had to dismantle the car. They put me on a gurney eventually, and they started taking me to a series of hospitals. This should be a picture of those hospitals. Uh, well, they weren't able to handle the kind of catastrophic injuries I had. They were going to airlift me from the Huntsville Hospital to the nearest level one trauma center in Houston, Memorial Hermann Hospital, 80 miles away, but the weather was too bad for helicopters to take off. So I had to be transported by ambulance those 80 miles in a driving rainstorm on a Wednesday afternoon. Accident happened at 11.45 a.m. I arrived at Memorial Hermann Hospital in Houston at 6.15 p.m. that night, six and a half hours after the wreck, and I would be in a hospital bed from that moment forward for 13 months and have 34 major operations to put me back together again. So why does this matter? Here's why I think it matters. I believe God answers prayer. I may not look like much, but I am an answered prayer. I had nothing to do with my survival. I, I didn't. The moment the truck struck me, I was standing at the gates of heaven. If you've been there, you don't want to be here, even Ohio. And um, I didn't want to come back. But these people were praying, and God said, yes, so I'm here. And I'm here as an answered prayer. How many of you have been to a, a wedding recently? Anybody? Wedding? Okay. You know how this works. Uh, the officiant comes and stands in the middle. The person is going to conduct the wedding. He'll be very dignified. She will be very dignified. But we know them. We know they're not. But they'll look that way. Then out of the side door will come uh, the groom and the groomettes. And the groom and the groomettes will stand facing outward. They also will look very dignified, but we know they're not. So here they are looking out. Then there'll be some music, nice music, and coming down the aisle will be some attractive ladies in dresses they'll never wear again, and they'll stand over here. They're all facing out. And now, the moment we've been waiting for, the doors will open. Coming through the back door, often on the arm of her father, is the bride. Now, when the groom walks in, they'll just lean over and say, is that him? What happens when the bride walks in? People stand up, they turn around, they've come from miles and miles to see her dress. That's what they're here for, and that's what she wants them to see, her dress. I had an accident 30 years ago, and my daughter got married about 14 years ago. I remember walking her down the aisle. My daughter is currently a stage four cancer victim. She's already had one of her kidneys removed. She's in chemotherapy. My daughter, Nicole, I walked her down the aisle to Mary Scott. I looked down the aisle at Scott and realized no one is worthy to marry my daughter. But I brought her down anyway. She seemed to love him. She leaned over to me, and this is what my daughter said to me. Daddy, I sure am glad you're here today. When I got married 45 years ago, I was standing here looking at my wife coming down the aisle. I'll never forget it. How awesome it was. How beautiful it was. How memorable. Listen to these words from Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. When the Bible says there's no sea, it means nothing separates us from each other in heaven. Let's face it, oceans separate us here on earth. Not as much as they used to when this was written, but they still separate us. Nothing separates us from each other in heaven. We're all together all the time. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. Now listen to this. You may have heard this before, but you may never have thought about it this way. I didn't before I was hit by a big truck. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Now that's the image that scripture gives us about heaven. And that's the way we should think about it. Like a groom standing at the foot of the aisle with incredible anticipation about the bride, which of course is the church. This is the people of God. Listen, we don't think about heaven like that, do we? In fact, we don't think about heaven until we're not having a wedding in the place. There's a body and a casket up here, and we're having a funeral. Then we think about heaven, because we're about to take him or her out to the cemetery. That's when we think about heaven. 
What if we thought about heaven and lived like it where we anticipated it? We're so excited about it, we're trying to help other people get into it. Well, that's what the Bible says we should do. We should think about heaven like a groom looking at the bride coming down the aisle. I think we'd be a lot more excited than we seem to be in this life now. Now the dwelling of God is with men, it said. And he will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. In those verses, three times, the best thing about heaven is mentioned. This is the best thing about heaven. Three times. You will be with God. That's the best thing about heaven. Oh, yes, there are angels. I saw them and heard them. Oh, yes, there is a street of gold. I, I, I walked down it. Oh, yes, there's all those things and more than words could even describe. But, but really, this is it. We'll be with God. We're not hoping God shows up. We're not trying to pray that God will happen. God, it's his place. We were with him. It just doesn't get any better than that. But there are some practical things. He will wipe away every tear from their eye. Oh, there's been plenty of those. Watch the news. Just, just watch the first 15 minutes of any newscast and see who did what to who. No tears in heaven. No tears. There will be no more death. There's also the 15 minutes of the first 15 minutes. Of who died? How did they die? Who shot who? No death in heaven. I'm tired of death. I've done too many funerals in my life. Hundreds of them. Babies. Cancer victims. Kids that were shot by their best friend playing with a gun. I mean, I've done a lot of funerals. Some not quite that tragic. Some people just lived for a long life and they passed away. But you know what? The people out there in the audience, they were hurting. They were missing them. Hey, there are no goodbyes in heaven, only hellos. So tired of death. No death in heaven. No one dies. There's no birth there. There's no death there. It's heaven. There's more. Or mourning. Well, of course, there's no mourning because there's no need for it. No one dies. Or crying. Again, referring to tears. There's no crying in heaven. And here's my favorite. Or pain. There's no pain in heaven. And let's face it, there's plenty of it here. Physical, emotional, spiritual, pain. We, there's no pain in heaven for the old order of things has passed away. I think we forget about that because we have a tendency to think of the Bible as an old antiquated book. A lot of people do. But the truth is it's a new thing. God is doing a whole new thing here. Heaven is a new place. It's under construction right now. And you can trust me, when Jesus finishes with it, he's coming back. So that's what we can look forward to. I, I did look forward to it. I just wasn't planning to die that day when I got killed by the 18 year so Dick's praying, I live, I'm in the hospital, and I really began to understand prayer. This next slide should be about the prayer. Is it? It is. In John chapter 14, Thomas stands up from the dinner table, the Passover table, right before Jesus is arrested. Jesus has just told them he's about to leave. They didn't believe him. They didn't want him to leave even though he had repeatedly said something about leaving and that he was going to prepare a place, Thomas stands up and says, we don't know where you're going and we don't know how to get there. Hey, listen, we're so Thomas, aren't we? I mean, we're still asking the question, is there a heaven? And there is one, how do I get there? Great questions. Maybe you're here today and you've asked that question, can I go to heaven? Is there really a heaven? How do I get to heaven? Jesus answered, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So if you want to go to heaven, you're going to have to go through Jesus. And I'm here to say that all paths do not lead to heaven. One path leads to heaven. Jesus leads to heaven. That's why he died on the cross. You've heard about it already. So I found that out the hard way. <laughs> I got run over by a truck. In that same set of scriptures... Jesus also says this, you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Now, there's a pretty omnibus statement. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Does this mean name it and claim it? No, it doesn't mean that. In my name means it coincides with the will of God. These people were asking for me to live. They didn't know I was already dead. 
And then when I got back, they were asking for me to walk because I was told I would never walk again under any circumstances. They were asking for me to be able to use this arm, which ended up in the back seat of the car. And I was told if they ever even put it back on, it would just hang by my side for the rest of my life. I walked up here on the stage on my own two legs, and this is that arm that was in the back seat of the car. So they were praying, and God said yes. My father uh, fought in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam in the U.S. Army, all three wars. An authentic American hero had a chest full of medals to show for it. My father would come and visit me in the hospital. This next slide is pretty hard to look at, so you don't have to if you don't want to. It's a picture of me in the hospital. I had lost four and a half inches of my left femur. I had lost my left arm, and they were going to take them off, including my right leg, because I could not be elevated to get breathing treatments. I developed double pneumonia. Forget the injuries, I'm going to die of pneumonia. Because they couldn't elevate me to give me breathing treatments, they were going to remove everything. My wife was brought in and given five minutes to decide that she wanted to allow them to do an experimental treatment on, us, on me that had never been used before. In fact, it had only been patented three weeks before my accident. It involved breaking my leg in another place and putting external fixators, that is, these enormous stainless steel halos around my leg and then turning screws on those halos four times a day to stretch the remaining bones in my leg hoping that they would eventually close the four and a half inches gap. It was hideous. I had 30 open wounds in my leg for a year. They also decided to fix my arm, if you can go back to that slide before. The two small bones in your forearm can be transplanted from other places. They took bones out of my left hip pelvis and they put them in my arm, so that's where these bones came from. All the skin on my arm came off my right leg. If an archaeologist finds my body 50 years from now, they're going to think they found the missing link. I have been completely rearranged anatomically. My dad is sitting down at the foot of the bed, the old drill sergeant, the real crusty guy, one tough hombre, my dad. My mother came in the room one time and saw this, passed out, was carried out, and never came in the room again. She would talk to me around the door when she came to visit me. 250 miles they came one way, every week. So my dad's sitting down at the end, just saw the picture. We talked about sports, we talked about cars, and then he got up, those are our conversations. He got up and he walked around to the other side of the bed. If you look real close, you could see my unbroken limb, the only thing resting on my chest. And my old drill sergeant dad leaned down, he took that hand in his hand, and this is what my father said into my ear. Son, I would give anything to trade places with you. I'm a father and a grandfather, I understand. I did get better, and he got worse. All those wars caught up with him. In a few years, I was headed 250 miles the other direction, holding my dad's hand. Instead of weighing 190 pounds, he weighed 100. He was in a fetal position. And I would hold his hand and say to my father, Dad, I really love you. I would go outside, my mother would follow me outside. My mother stood beside my father's bed for 61 years. She would take my hands and she would look up into my eyes. My mother would say this, son, the doctors have done everything they can to make your dad feel better. They tried, really, but nothing makes him feel better than when one of his children comes to talk to him. When's the last time you really talked to God the Father? Really? What do you think would happen in Ohio if you decided to pray for people who are not ready to go to heaven for the kind of passion that preacher did over my dead body in the car? I'll answer that question. A revival would start here. Why not here? Why not now? It starts with prayer. I am an answer for it. Nothing to do with my smile. Jesus also made this statement about miracles in the same set of scriptures. And 
he was trying to prepare them for what's going to happen next. Remember, he's about to leave, be arrested. So he's talking about miracles. And, and that's the slide after the next one. Here's the statement he makes. Same, same scripture, John 14. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. What an amazing statement. He's talking to guys who saw him do miracles. I mean, make the lame walk and, and give sight to the blind. They were standing outside the tomb when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus comes waltzing out of the tomb, and he's telling these guys now, and you, anyone who has faith in me, will do what I've been doing and will do even greater things than me. What an amazing statement that is. I think God's doing some of his best stuff now. You, you're going you're to need a miracle. If you live long enough, you need a miracle. God is still in the miracle business. I know because it's a miracle I'm here. I got run over by an 18-wheeler and a head-on collision. Killed instantly. I lost my left leg. I lost my left arm. I've got my left leg. I've got my left arm. God is still in the miracle business. Another lady walked up with this book, <laughs> and she's clutching it to her chest. It's in the lobby of a church, just like that one out there. She leans over the table, and she's very uncomfortably close to me, and here's what she said. You sent me this book in jail. I said, yes, ma'am, we send a lot of books to people who are incarcerated. Wednesday, a week ago, I was at the Women's Correctional Facility in Honolulu, Hawaii speaking to all the inmates in the state of Hawaii who are ladies. I, 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 I enjoy being with people who are incarcerated because they need a miracle. They need hope. They need to know that there's a new normal and they won't be like they were before. This lady says, I, I was in for my sixth DUI. I'm an alcoholic. And I thought I was going to die. I'm in my 60s. I've never been to jail. And so I asked one of the other ladies when I finally got up the courage, how do you make it? How do you get through this? And she said, I'll tell you how I got through it. They, they, somebody loaned me this book about this guy who was in a wreck, and he, he was never going to be the same again, and he had to find a new normal. He'd been knocked down, but he hadn't been knocked out. How do I get this book? Well, I don't know who has it, but maybe you can get online and order it. She did. We sent it to her. Now she's standing in front of me in the lobby of the church. And here's what she said. I've come to ask you to pray for me because three weeks of the day in the church that we were standing, I'm going to start leading Celebrate Recovery for Alcoholics and Addicts. I said to her, who, who better than you? Yeah, who better than you? I think that's a miracle. I think God's still in the miracle business. Greater things. Anyone. I, I knew I was never going to be the same after the wreck happened, and I descended into depression. I had seen heaven and had it taken away from me. If you could just go to that last slide where I'm in the bed, that would be great. Um, this is the way I lived for a long time. You could see where they took the skin off my right leg. You could see where my right leg was broken at the knee. You could barely see the devices on my left arm. One morning at 3 a.m. after many weeks in the hospital, I started shaking my fist, and this is what I said. Why can't you send somebody here who understands what this is like? If I could talk to somebody who, who gets this, everyone's nice to me, they're praying for me, but I want to talk to somebody who understands what this is like. I think I can make it, no matter what the outcome. And God rebuked me. I heard some music that was playing beside me, and here's what he said to me. Listen closely. This is not about you, it's about me. And what I could do through you now, I can never do before the truck hits you. You need to get over your pity party, and you need to turn your pain into a purpose. You need to take your test and make a testimony. You need to take your mess and find a message that's going to bless somebody else. You're clapping, but you can do that lost a spouse you know what it feels like oh, you need to bless somebody else who's going through the same thing been through bankruptcy divorce you can either shake your fist at God which won't bother him a bit he's God 
He'd rather you shake your fist and be angry at him than ignore it. But you have to turn this into this. Let me help you. I understand how you feel. And then you'll know why you went through that. I call that finding a new normal. I've been calling it that for 30 years. I've been beaten up, but I'm not beat. And neither are you. God help you help others know him. When the big truck hit me, I was standing at the gates of heaven immediately. I didn't go down a long tunnel. There wasn't a bright light at the end of the tunnel. When you hit it 100 miles an hour, I was in heaven. And if you read the rest of Revelation 21, you'll find out there are 12 gates to heaven, three on each side of the great city of God. And the reason it's three on each side is because it doesn't matter what direction you come from in this world, just come, 12 gates. I'm at one of the gates that looks like the inside of an oyster. It's made of pearl. It's a pearl gate. That's not just an old song. It's a, it's a reality. And it was dazzling. I thought it was living. It was like incredibly brilliant. And, and, and it was because of the light reflecting off the gate that made it look like it was alive. And there is no sun or moon or in heaven there. They don't need them. God illuminates heaven with his glory and majesty. And Jesus actually has a different name, a new name, in heaven, he is called the Lamp of God, not Lamb of God. He'll be the Lamb of God, but he is now the Lamp of God. So you will bask in the glow of, of Jesus and God Almighty in heaven. It'll be brilliant. If you were, you if you had your earthly eyes in heaven, you wouldn't be able to see it. It's just that brilliant. But you won't have your earthly eyes. I panned down from this magnificent gate, which actually had a small entrance, would go in one at a time, and I'm looking at people. Like people. I mean, and I knew all of them. I didn't see anybody I didn't know. And they knew I was coming, obviously. Let me say this to you. I'm often asked, do people in heaven miss me? No, they don't miss you. They expect you. You see, the moment you give your heart to Jesus, they write your name on a registration book up there called the Lamb's Book of Life. You want your name in this book. I just checked out of a hotel this morning. When I checked in, the first thing they asked me is, do you have a reservation? If I didn't have a reservation, they might not have had a room for me. Heaven takes reservations. There's a book up there that's a reservation book, the Lamb's Book of Life. I had my name in the book. I wasn't planning to die that day. I didn't meet anybody who was planning to die the day they died. But they were ready. They were prepared. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. You have to be prepared for the place. That means you have to make a decision. Do it. It won't come naturally. Just because you're a member of a church, which is a glorious thing to be, just because you try to do the right thing, which is what we should all be doing, it's not going to get you into heaven. An authentic personal relationship with Jesus Christ will get you into heaven. I wasn't planning to die that day, but I was ready. So that's the question you have to ask yourself. Are you ready and are you sure? I'm looking at my grandfather's face. I've been with him when he died. I told you about my dad. He was always on, deployed somewhere. So Papa never left us. He was a carpenter. He wore a tool belt. I thought it was awesome when I was a little boy. I followed him around like a puppy. So did the rest of my brothers. And we all wanted to be like him. I'm still trying to be like him. He was illiterate. He could not read or write. He never went to school because he worked since he was six years old. Depression, World War II. All of them. He made them all. He was a hero to me. He could take lumber and nails and build places like this. I saw him do it. Many of them are still standing. One night I, I got a phone call that he was dying. I rushed to the house. I got in the ambulance with him. I drove to the hospital. And I'm standing there when the doctor came out and said, I'm sorry I did everything I could, but I lost him. I got a lot of broken bones in this body, but nothing hurts like a broken heart. When Papa died, it broke my heart. Last time I saw him, he was in a casket at the church. He did not look good. Now I'm standing at the gates of heaven. He's right in front of me. And he looked great. If you want to look great, heaven is where you want to be. I mean, you look nice now, but some of us have got some miles on us, don't we? Yeah. I, I was preaching at a, at, a, at a homeless church in Hawaii. There's lots of homeless people in Hawaii. I was under an overpass. And I was preaching, and the pastor of the church's name was Jimmy. And I was talking about how heaven will be perfect. We'll be just the way God wanted us to be when he made us in the first place. Pastor Jimmy interrupted the service. He said, I want to know about 
hair. I looked over at Pastor Jimmy, who was follically deprived, and I said, well, Pastor, as, long, as, much, as best I can remember, everybody I saw in heaven had hair. And Pastor Jimmy said, praise God. I don't know what your priority is today, but you're going to have hair in heaven. I mean, I used to have hair that was like dark, but I got over it. And a lot of it let go. You'll be perfect in heaven, just the way. Hey, listen, my grandfather was missing fingers on both hands from all that hard labor, all those difficult jobs. He extended his hands to me. He spoke a language I never heard before. My grandfather says to me, welcome home, Donnie. That's what he called me here. On earth. I looked down at the hands that used to hold me when I was a little boy, and for the first time in my life, all of his fingers were there. He was perfect. Great-grandmother Hattie was standing beside him. She had osteoporosis. She was permanently bent over like this on earth. She wasn't missing fingers. She was missing her teeth here on earth. She had some dentures she seldom wore. But when she smiled at me at the gates of heaven, she was six inches taller. And it was the first time I ever saw her real smile. Heaven is a great reunion with those who have gone before us. You won't even remember you were separated when you get there. They don't miss you. They expect you. There were some friends from high school that died when they were 18 years old. Oh, my goodness, what a tragedy that was for us 18-year-olds. We just didn't even know how to process that. My great-grandmother was 78 when she died. So there is no age in heaven because there's no time in heaven. There's no birth there. There's no death there. There's no age there. It's eternal. So that's not an issue. No one ever talks about it. It's just not important. Here, age is very important. There, never important. It's timeless. Time. I could have been in heaven for 90 years, not 90 minutes. I was away from earth for 90 years. So I'm surrounded by these people. And I'm trying to think about them. Did they really know each other on earth? No, they didn't. Of course, everybody knows every, everybody in heaven. There's no introductions there. You will know as you are known. And so I'm surrounded by these people. And then I came back to this. And I'm laying in the bed, and I'm thinking about all those people. I didn't tell anybody what I saw for a couple of years. I didn't have the words for it. But I kept thinking about those people, and here's what I realized after I thought about them, individually and collectively. These are the people who helped me get to heaven. They took me to church when I was young, and my family didn't go to church. My next-door neighbor, Miss Norris, was there. She took me to church when I was nine years old. She asked my mother over the back fence if I would go. And I jumped up and down and said, yes, I'd like to go. I go with my grandmother. She takes me, but I don't get to see her very often. Mr. Norris said, be dressed and stand by your mailbox on Sunday morning. A whole station wagon full of kids pulled up in front of my house. You could hear them down the street. Mr. Norris looked down at me with those glasses out to here and a smile the same size. And she says, honey, would you like to go to the Lord's house today? And I said, Yes, ma'am, I would. And she said, boys and girls, move over. Donnie's coming to church with us. And I climbed in that old station wagon, and I knew somebody cared about me. Miss Norris met me at the gates of heaven. She deserved to be there. She helped me get there. So I ask you what you're doing in West Lake. What are you doing in Ohio? Here's what we all should be doing, helping others get to heaven. And we have a lot of work to do. God help us help others know him. Over the heads of the people was a magnificent gate. The entrance was small. I could see the golden boulevard down the center of the city. If you read Revelation 21, you'll see, you'll see it says street of gold, not streets, street. Now, there may be some other streets, but it just says street. So I'm looking at this golden boulevard. There are buildings on both sides of them. They, they look like mansions to me. We all get one according to Jesus. And, and, and I want to go down the street. I want to go up to Pinnacle in the middle of the city where there are thrones and the brightest light of all is coming from. I know that's where the Lord is, high and lifted up. I wanted to go down the street. I wanted to fall at the feet of the great God of all creation. And I wanted to say, thank you. Thank you for letting me come. Thank you. I never got a chance. I didn't move past the people. They parted, let me go. I'm the new guy. And, and I'm, I'm immediately immersed in angels. They're everywhere. Now, there was one in, with me in the car holding my hand. I didn't know that until a while back. I thought Dick Honorecker was holding my hand. He never touched my hand. But I was holding a hand. Angels are everywhere. We do not become angels in heaven. 
separate group of beings from us, created for a separate purpose from us. But they're the ones who bear us up, and they're the ones who protect us. And, and here I was surrounded by angels. Some of them had six wings, some had two wings, some had no wings, and they were everywhere. I could, I could actually hear their wings, not just their voices. You can hear their voices. I could hear the wings of angels. What a comforting and encouraging sound that was. And I could hear the music, thousands of songs at the same time without chaos. When I was a young guy, I was a disc jockey for a lot of radio stations. One of the things you never did on the radio is play two songs at the same time. If you want to see the switchboard light up, that would do it. People call and say, I like both of those songs, but I only want to hear one at a time. In heaven, I heard thousands of songs at the same time without chaos, all of them glorifying God, for he alone is worthy of our worship. One song was kind of above the rest of them, and here it is. Holy, holy, holy. Over and over again. Because he is. And this is his place. Which brings up an interesting question. How did I get to heaven? Because I am not holy. I have witnesses. Ask my wife. Ask my kids. Ask my church. Let me tell you how I got holy. On a Sunday morning like this one, and I'm in a service like this, and at the end of the service, the pastor said, who wants to go to heaven? We're taking reservations this morning. And I was sitting on the third row right where you are, sir. They were singing some music up here. And I mean, I was like in a three-point stance. I had I'd been going to Bible study because I got my driver's license. I could take myself to church even though nobody else went in my family. I sat in that Bible study class of teenagers came to my house and invited me to church, which is the way it works. And so I, I, I read the Bible, and I, I, I was so interested and so, so, it was so urgent in my life. So when he said, who wants to go to heaven, and they stood up, I, I practically ran down the aisle. I took the pastor's hand, and I said, I want to go to heaven. And he said, son, this is the best decision you'll ever make. I didn't know that. 22 years later, on a lonely highway in East Texas, an 18-wheeler was going to run over me and kill me. But thank God I was ready. Are you ready? I mean, if I can get killed on the way to church, you're going to leave in a few minutes. You better be ready. You're going to take your last breath here and your next breath somewhere else. You'll learn next week, hell is just as real as heaven. You better be ready. We're going to give you a chance in just a moment. I'm passing the people now. I'm going through the angels. I'm going through the music. I can still hear that music. I carry it with me everywhere. It's the one thing that's portable. I brought it back. The more weary I grow here, the louder the music is. I saw colors I've never seen before. They're beyond the spectrum. I heard sounds I've never heard before. I smelled aromas I've never smelled before. Do you know one of the aromas you smell in heaven are the prayers of the saints that emanate from the throne of God. So I'm going in now, and the wall's very thick, and I'm entering inside, and my friends are following me, and I am glorious. I'm not thinking about earth or anything down here. I'm home, and that's where I want to be. As I entered in the gates, portal and inside it all stopped I found myself in silence and darkness and I wanted to cry out of course what's going on I, I just got here what's happening before I could even say that verbalize that I heard one voice not the voice of thousands of angels I heard one voice and this voice is not in front of me like heaven was it's behind me it's that preacher in that car singing that song and he's now making me sing it with him so I will remain conscious and then this I came back to this uncertainty pain that I don't even have the words for I didn't know you could hurt like that every day I would be looking up into heaven because it's the only direction I could look and I would ask the same question and it's a question you would ask in the same situation. Why? Why did you let me see that? Take it away from me. Why? I have an answer after all these years. And here it is. 
so I could be in Westlake, Ohio, and tell you to your face, heaven is real, and Jesus is the way. As wonderful as that is, it won't matter at all if you're not going. So right now we're taking reservation. Everybody in the room can make a decision today. Everybody. Oh, and you say, I've been a Christian for years. Good. Wonderful. I'll see you there. But let me ask you a question. Who's going to be in heaven because of you? Are you finished? I don't think so. I notice that very few of us rapture right after we get saved. That means we're here. That means we have a lot of work to do. All of you can think of a neighbor, a coworker, a classmate, a family member, a friend that you care about here that you're not sure is going to heaven at all. When's the last time you brought them to church? When's the last time you told them about Jesus? When's the last time you gave them a Bible? How consistent are you in your Christian life in front of them? We're here to help everyone else get there. So pray for those people today before you leave this room. You can come down here and kneel and pray. You can pray right where you are. But go over those people in your mind at a moment when we close our eyes. If you've never trusted the Lord, this is your opportunity. If you read the Bible, you'll not realize that Jesus only passed by people often just once. He was on his way somewhere else. This may be your only chance. We're taking reservations today. This is a divine appointment. You're here because God wants you to be, and he wants to save you and take you to heaven. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day, and thank you for this church. Thank you for its witness. Right now, Lord, I'm praying for every individual in this room. Some, some with their eyes closed and their heads bowed, they just need to start praying for people they know and love who are not ready to go to heaven. I think specific prayers bring specific answers. So let's name names and pray for those people and say, God, help me help them know you. Use me, God. I want to see them at the gates of heaven someday. There may be others in this room. In fact, there, there should be. There probably are people who are not ready to go to heaven. Truth be told, they're not ready. They're not sure they're ready. Lord, let's look for honesty right now. If you're in this room and you're not sure that if your life ended today, you would go to heaven, and you would like for me to pray for you, I'm not going to identify you, obviously, and I'm not going to, I don't know your names, I'm not coming to where you are, but in a moment, I'm going to ask you just to lift your hand and say, Don, I am not sure I'm going to heaven, so would you pray for me? If that is you, with no one looking around, just lift your hand right now. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. All over the room. Thank you. Okay, you can put those hands down. No doubt there are probably some others who just couldn't quite lift that hand up into the air. But you, in your heart, you're not sure of your salvation. You're not. We're not trying to make you doubt it. We just want to make sure because we love you and we want to see you in heaven someday. So if you lifted your hand or even if you didn't, just, just pray with me and say in your heart of hearts, Jesus, I understand now. I know now that you died for me on the cross and that you had to die for me on the cross. I am a sinner. And I realize now that I am, and that would keep me from going to heaven. It's a holy place. I cannot be with a holy God in an unholy condition. But Jesus can make me holy in the sight of God. Jesus, come into my heart and save me. Forgive me of my sins. I am a sinner. I've done things I shouldn't, and I didn't do some things I should have forgive me. I repent. I turn from that way of life. And I turn to you, Lord. I want to serve you. I want to live for you from now on. God, shine the light on my path, and I will give you glory. The Bible says if you pray a prayer like that, and if you mean it, you're sincere, your name is now being written in the Lamb's book of life. The angels are singing your name right now. If that's you, in a moment as we stand, I'm just going to ask you to leave your seat immediately and come down and talk to one of the prayer counselors down here. Just come and talk to them. They'll answer your questions. They'll help you do what is next. They will love you into the kingdom of God. So when we stand, just be obedient. Just like Dick Honorecker did to the car. 
You may not understand it all. In fact, you won't. But he, by faith, he crawled in the car and prayed over a dead body, and I'm here today. That's what happened.